Good evening, everyone. Glad you guys are here. We're going to get into some uh, some really interesting stuff this evening. But before I begin into the lesson, I want to I want to make something clear. Last few weeks we've been studying uh, Mystery Babylon, the horror, uh, the mother of all harlots, uh, and when we expose the Catholic Church for what it is because of what God's Word has to say about the Catholic Church. And when you study God's Word, it's pretty clear what God has to say about, about this, um, about Mystery Map Babylon, the mother of harlots. I just want to make it clear that we're not doing this because we hate Catholics. I want to make it clear. And for those who are listening online, we're doing this because God Himself has revealed to us who this woman is. And that's why we say the things that we say. Uh, we have showed how Mystery Babylon religion began in Genesis chapter 10 by Nimrod. And then the Mystery religion moved to the city of Pergamos. And following the Persian, following the Persian invasion, when the priests of Babylon, when the priests of this Mystery religion fled, and they went to Pergamos and they established a center of worship there. And that this Mystery Babylon religion spread throughout the Roman Empire and eventually enjoyed great popularity in the city of Rome. In fact, Rome was labeled New Babylon because of the prevalence of this religion, the, how this religion had taken a hold in the city. It is the system we are against. It is the false teachings of Roman Catholicism that we point out and we highlight. It is the papacy that we declare as being unscriptural. Nor in the Bible you will find that there is a representative on earth that has taken the place of Christ. And what is one of the titles that the Pope gives himself? The Vicar of Christ. The Vicar of Christ. There's no such thing as a Vicar of Christ. Christ has given his position and his place and his authority to no one. I want to be clear of this fact. And I also want you to listen to what God tells the Roman Catholics in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. God is pleading before he destroys this, this system, this religious system. He's pleading with the people and he says, Come out of her, mm -hmm. that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And I don't know if you know this, but inside Catholicism itself, there are many in the Catholic Church that say that the, the, that the Antichrist will be a future Pope. They call him the Antipope. And they say that this, pope, this Antichrist will come out of a church that is apostatized. Now, i give you some references on the bottom. There's the Oba prophecy, the prophecy of Premol. Now, I do not consider these prophecies that this church has to be prophecies from God. But these so-called prophecies come from within the Roman Catholic Church themselves. And they themselves have written, have written volumes about the, the apostasy of the church as they see it. Revelation chapter 17 clearly teaches beyond all shadow of doubt that when Jesus Christ comes back he will destroy this religious system he will destroy the ten king federated Roman Catholic world that professes to be Christian headed by the Antichrist and given as we say material assistance by the Pope himself and I the Bible tells us that God sees this system which is a political a religious an economic system and as we study the book of Revelation it will be a global system God tells us that this system is nothing but a godless, ecclesiastical whore. Revelation 17.1 says, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. These are words that come from the Bible. These are words that God has uttered. These are not words that we are making up from our own minds. Now, I want to get into Revelation chapter 18 this morning. And Revelation chapter 18 continues a description of the whore from Revelation chapter 17. They are both parenthetical chapters. Who can tell me what a parenthetical chapter is? Something that's inserted in. Yes, something that is inserted in, in between the narrative to give us additional information. And both these chapters, 17 and 18, deal with Rome. The references given in those chapters, well, this whore who is referred to in these two chapters is a political power. It's a religious power or ecclesiastical power and a commercial power. And in this lesson, we will look at Rome's commercial power and subsequent destruction. 
I do not believe that Babylon is a reference to a future city that will be built in Iraq like some do. And I suspect that those who teach that Babylon in the, in the, in the Revelation is anything but the Roman Catholic Church, I have my suspicions that they are somehow connected to the Vatican. Either they're funded somehow, or they're parachurch ministries, or they have some kind of connection with Catholicism. Because the Bible tells us in Romans 17, 9, and here is the mind, the what? The mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There is only one system in this world that can be described by this verse. And that's the Roman Catholic Church. Because remember, the Roman Catholic Church is part of the old Roman Empire, which was founded on seven hills. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. It just takes a little bit of common sense. Yes, sir. For those that, like, suspect that, no, it's going to be a, a, a new Babylon built in Iraq, is there, like, a specific location that has seven hills that they think that might fit that description? It's a good question that you ask. There's a lot of cities around the world that are located on seven hills. But there's only one global system or there's only one entity that has such influence across this world that's located on seven hills. And that's the Vatican City, the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, last week we went into detail. We showed how uh, the chapter 17 clearly describes the Roman Catholic Church. Clearly describes. And this, this week or today, we're going to look at the economic clout that the Roman, Church, the Roman Catholic Church has, which is veiled in a mystery of, of associations and corporations and trusts and so forth and so on. We'll get into that. So, chapter 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now these things in this verse 1 refer to what John sh saw in chapter 17. Chapter 17, in this chapter, John was told the mystery of the woman and the manner in which she would be destroyed. Because chapter 18 tells us that the, the system, Mystery Babylon, will be destroyed. I want to reread a couple of verses from Re Revelation chapter 17. And the ten horns, and we looked at the ten horns, who can tell me... Who the ten horns are? Justin? Ten kings. The ten kings. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us it is. Great. You're paying attention. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall what? They'll hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So remember, it was that these ten kings who gave the Antichrist his power and authority over this new world order. He ruled with them for a while and then they gave him complete authority over this worldwide system. And we know that the Antichrist comes into power because he will be aided and abetted by the false prophet. But according to these verses, we know that they will turn on the system they help create, and they will turn on the Antichrist whom they help bring to power. Now, I want to pause here for a minute. The Battle of Armageddon will take place in which part of the world? Middle East. Middle East, yeah, surrounding Israel. Now, what do you think these armies are doing surrounding Israel? Who, are you, who do you think they're after? The Jews. The Jews, yes. But who, are, who do you think, according to these verses, who do you think they're really after? Remember, who will be ruling from Jerusalem? The Antichrist. Who will they, who will they be after? The Antichrist. the Antichrist. They will turn on him at the end. They will turn on him and his system. Remember, at the end... Through the help of the Pope, I believe the future, the false prophet will be a future Pope. It could be this one. I'm not den denying or, or, or dismissing the fact that uh, Pope Francis could very well be the false prophet of Revelation. So the Antichrist, with the help of the Catholic Church, will create a religious, political, economic, worldwide system. And he will rule from Jerusalem. 
Now, because of all the plagues, I believe that God will pour upon the earth and all the calamities that will befall the earth because of the judgments of God. They're going to need an, a, a, an explanation for what's going on. And they're going to blame it on the Antichrist. Because remember, he's going to be the king over the Jews. So, quote, unquote, a king. Because they will accept him as their Messiah. Keep that in mind. The Pope, will, the Pope will be the false prophet who will help the Antichrist come to power. He'll put all his clout, his political clout behind this man as he ascends into power. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So at the end, they're going to turn on him. Look at verse 16. It's pretty clear in Revelation chapter 17. And the ten horns, these are the ten kings who gave their authority and their power to who? To the Antichrist. Antichrist. Right. And the Bible says that the false prophet will cause men to take the mark and will cause men to worship the image that it will be set up in the temple. It's the false prophet that's going to push the world to worship this guy and to have him lead them. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, what? What will these horns do? Who will they hate? They will hate the whore. They will hate the system that they themselves help create. And that's how Babylon will be destroyed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. <coughs> they will hate the religious part of the system. And we'll, we'll, get, into, uh, we'll get into this in a, little, in a little bit later. Now, at some point, like we said, they will turn on the system they help create, and they will turn on the Antichrist whom they help bring to power. There are examples in the Bible of the enemies of Israel doing just that, turning on each other. Remember the story of Gideon with his 300 men. He went to attack the Midianites with pitchers and lanterns. He had no weapons. Mm -hmm. And look what happened. Judges chapter 2, verse 20, chapter 7, verse 22. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shita in Zererath, and to the border of Abel Neholah, and to Tabath. So God caused them to kill each other. Again, during the battle against the Philistines, the same thing happened. Look at this scenario over here in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 20. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and it was a very great discomfiture. The Philistines started killing each other. God caused this to happen. What does the word discomfiture mean? It's a type of confusion. Somebody gave this example. When you realize you put salt instead of sugar in mama's tea. <laughs> that's what discomfiture means. And that's what I'm on to the Philistines. I like that one. I just I stole it. It was a very good example. And again... During the Battle of Armageddon, the same thing will happen. They will turn on each other. How do we know this? The book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, verse 21 tells us, And I will call for a sword against him. This is Gog and Magog. Throughout all my mountains, the mountains of Israel, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. So when all these armies gather around Jerusalem, right before Christ comes, they're going to start killing each other. Because you're going to have... Turks and Persians and Libyans and Russians and Syrians and Iranians and, and they're going to turn on each other. God's going to cause this to happen. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And when the end comes, God will put it in the ten kings to hate the whore and destroy her. Chapter 18, verse 2. A habitation of devils. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. That's the angel that John saw in verse 1, saying, Babylon the greatest fallen has fallen has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You will notice here in this verse the connection between unclean spirits and birds. And unclean spirits are synonymous with devils or demons. Now I want to give you a couple of verses to help you uh, to, to see the connection here. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. So, what power did God give to the twelve disciples? To cast out unclean spirits. 
to cast out, you got it, I keep this in mind, it gave them power to cast out unclean spirits. You see that? Look at Mark chapter 13, verse 14 and 15. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out what? Devils. Devils. Do you see that the, the uh, this is the same story, but different accounts. The first account is in the Gospel of Matthew. The second account is in the Gospel of Mark. And in the account of Matthew, it says that they will cast out unclean spirits. And in the account of Mark, it says they will cast out devils, which is demons. Mm -hmm. So do you see what are unclean spirits? Devils, demons. So they're one and the same, different, different description. And one thing that these evil spirits can do is keep the word of God from people and keep them from getting saved. Look at what Luke 8, 12 says about these demons. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh a devil. And what? What does he take away? He takes away the word. Whose word? He takes away God's word from their hearts. And why does he do that? Why does the devil take God's word away from people's hearts? So that they don't get saved. And that's what Paul says. God has called me, when he was the apostle to the Gentiles, to help these Gentiles be delivered from darkness and come into light. And that's why when you have friends and family that are not saved, you have to pray earnestly for them. You have to pray for them that God will open their eyes that they may see the truth. Because the devil's purpose and job is to blind them. At this time, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, Babylon will become the habitation, that is another word for dwelling place, of all demons. And they are called, these demons are called by a variety of names in the Bible. They're foul spirits, they're unclean birds, they're unclean spirits, they're hateful birds. And if you study the scriptures, you'll find that birds in the Bible are often a type of demons. We read in Revelation chapter, what we read, yeah, because, uh, uh, let me backtrack here a little bit. In the parable of the sower, who eats up the seeds? Birds. The birds. The birds eat the seed. Eat up the seed. Birds in the scriptures are a type of demons. So it's basically the gospel is, is spread. The gospel is spread and the demons come and they take the word of God out of people's hearts so they don't get saved. Now I want to read to Revelation chapter 16 verse 10. Now why am I reading this verse? Because Revelation chapter 18 verse 2 coincides with Revelation chapter 16 verse 10. And Revelation 18, what did we just re read? Mystery Babylon, that city will become a what? A habitation. A habitation of all what? Demons. All demons. Look what 16.10 says. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the east of the beast, upon the sea of the beast, sorry. And his kingdom was full of what? Darkness. Now this is not darkness like the sun not shining. Because who will be in heaven get, getting ready to come down? Yes. Jesus. And the Bible says when he will appear... He will be like a flash of lightning, brightness. He will be very bright. So it's not talking about darkness, meaning that light will be withheld from the world, but it's talking about spiritual darkness. And what happens after this darkness? They nod their tongues for pain. And that's the scary part of hell. Those who end up there, they will suffer pain for all eternity. And I believe God made hell such a bad place, so people wouldn't want to go there. And I believe this darkness is caused by the gathering of all these demonic spirits. And God will take all the devils and all the demons and he will gather them in this place at once. And then they will be cast into the lake of fire when he comes back forever and ever and ever. Are the demons going to be causing a lot of problems? Yes. Well, they cause a lot of problems today. So Let's go on to verse 3 now. Drunk with the wine of her fornication. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This fornication we said, we said is spiritual fornication. We said there's two types of fornication in the Bible. Spiritual and physical. Physical is when you have relations with someone other than your spouse. And spiritual is when you worship anyone but the true God. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth were waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And in this verse, verse 3, we see a repetition of the phrase, drunk with the wine of her fornication. This phrase, the statement, is found again in Revelation 14, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. That means that the kings of the earth partook 
of her spiritual fornication. They join her in worshipping the false god, the Antichrist. What will the Antichrist do when he appears on the scene? What's one thing he will say about himself? Mm -hmm. That he's God. And someone said that he's Christ, because the Jews will believe that he will be their Messiah. And I, I really believe we're not far from those days. There's a plan that the United Nations wants to set in motion by 2030. You know, Sweden by uh, 2023 will be completely cashless. And right now in Sweden, one of the things that people are doing is they're getting this chip. They're getting chipped. It's incredible what's going on in the world. And I want to give you some recent headlines here. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed some, a couple of notes. So we said we see this phrase, drunk with the wine of fornication. Uh, we, we dealt with this at length in Lesson 31 and 32, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But I want to give you some recent headlines. Pope Francis is inviting world leaders and young people to come together at the Vatican on May 14, 2020, for an event called Reinventing the Global Education Alliance. Uh, why do you think he picked May 14? Because it's the uh, Independence Day for Israel. I think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. They say that during this meeting, there will be representatives from various religions, NGOs, academia, cultural and political leaders. I gave you the link there for the, for the article. Remember what happened in February of 2019 in UAE? You guys remember that? We talked about this a few weeks ago. The Pope met at the United Arab Emirates and he held a mass, the first mass ever held in the Arabian Peninsula. And during this meeting, after he left, the United Arab Emirates agreed to open an interfaith compound called the Abrahamic Family House. In this compound, uh, there will be a church, a synagogue, and a mosque. What do you think they're getting ready to do? Join all the religions together. And during another meeting in Argentina, uh, the Pope said this on November 18, 2019. Interreligious dialogue is an important way to counter fundamentalist groups. That's us. Mike, Mike said it. That's us. So, they don't like us. Why don't they like us? Because we stand for the Bible, the authority of the Bible, and the authority of Jesus Christ. And, and, and because you stand for that, what do you call it? You call the homophobe, you call the right-wing extremist, you call all these, all these names. But yet we're the most obedient people a government can have. Why do we do that? I just like a go, ahead, go ahead, Dan. The Catholic Church, the universal church, the one true church is not fundamental. No. <laughs> if you're not, if you are, if you're supposed to be the one true church and you're not fundamental, what are you? Exactly. Like I, I don't get it. Exactly. Just where's the, where's the foundation? Okay. Well, I agree. You're right. You're right. But the thing is, they're not fundamental in, in essence because they want to be over everyone. And uh, I want to remind you, the Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope. You think that's a coincidence? Now, when a, verse 3 of Revelation chapter 18 says something very interesting. It tells us that the kings became rich through the abundance of her riches. When I f first st started studying the book of Revelation uh, decades ago, I couldn't understand this verse. I, I was able to make the connection between Mystery Babylon and the Roman Catholic Church, but I couldn't reconcile verse 3. How can a religion make the kings of the earth rich? I couldn't understand it until I started doing some digging. There's this guy called Avra Manhattan, and he wrote a book called titled Vatican Billions. Now he wrote this book about 30, 30 some years ago, and in his book he goes into great detail explaining how the Pope stole the wealth of the world throughout the centuries. Now, who, who has heard of the Inquisition? Okay, who can tell me in, a, in, in one brief sentence what the Inquisition was about? Kill everybody who wasn't a Catholic. Well, kill everybody that, didn't, that wasn't a Catholic, kill everybody that didn't believe like they believed. And what do you think they did with the people's property? Kept it. 
they kept it, they confiscated it. And uh, estimates are as high as 50, 60 million people were killed during the Inquisition. You can imagine how much money that is. Now I want to start off by, now I'm going to get into what some of you may consider conspiracy theories, but I'm going to give you just enough information to whet your appetite. I'm going to give you the links where you can go actually and read, read this information on your own. I want to start off by introducing you to the Rothschilds. Who's heard of these people? They are most, they, the, the most famous European banking dynasty, uh, and for the last 250 years they've been accumulating wealth. And through the wealth, they've been influential in, in changing the economies and the uh, political history of Europe, the economy and political history of Europe. Through their wealth, they've been able to do this. This house of the Rothschilds was founded by Mayor Amschel Rothschild. He was a German Jew born in Frankfurt, Germany, about... Uh, Three, almost 300 years ago. Now, this man Rothschild was one of the first few Jews who was allied with the German royal family. He was allied with the German royal family. And what does the Bible say? It's the kings of the earth that have been, that have been made rich by this system. And because of that, uh, what they allowed him to do is they allowed this man to manage the money. The German royal family's finances were managed by this guy, Rothschild, Mayor Rothschild. He had five sons, and even though they were Jews, they enjoyed social privileges in Germany. Why? Because they were connected with the German royal family. Today they say the Rothschild's family net worth is estimated to be between 300, get ready for this, 300 to 700 trillion dollars. 300 to 700 trillion dollars. There's many sources that say this. They have been accumulating their wealth for the last 260 years. Okay, in 2017, the global GDP was about 80 trillion. Just to give you an idea how, well, how wealthy these are. These are staggering numbers, mm -hmm. staggering numbers. In comparison, the richest American ever is John D. Rockefeller, and he was worth 400 billion dollars at his death. Now, if the Rothschilds for the last 206, now this is the entire family, the Rothschild family. If they were able to accumulate this much money in 260 years, how much money do you think the Catholic Church is able to accumulate in the last 1600 years? Now, why do I bring up the Rothschilds? Why are they so important? Because the House of Rothschild has been the long-standing trustee of the Vatican's wealth. They manage the finances of the Vatican City. And they've had a 1,300-year head start on a Rothschilds. Did you know that the Vatican Jesuits own part of the U.S. Federal Reserve? Now, I'm getting into conspiracy theories here for some of you. Maybe a little bit too much to handle, but we'll give you some information here. The, all the income tax that you, get pay, that you pay to the IRS, it gets deposited into the Federal Reserve by the U.S. Treasury. Did you know that? It's by law. Any check you write to the U.S. Treasury, they take the money and they deposit in the Federal Reserve. The U.S. government doesn't handle any money. Through the U.S. Treasury and through the Federal Reserve, that's how they handle everything. The Federal Reserve lends money to our country. Every year, they lend money to our country. That's why our debt keeps growing. keeps growing. Why? It'll never, it'll never, the debt will always increase because it's the Federal Reserve that lends our government the money to operate. Did you know that there are three corporations that run the world? The City of London, it is completely separate from the city of London, England. It's a little square, it's about a mile in square, a square mile, in the center of London where all the financial institutions of England are located. The other corporation is the, strict, the District of Columbia. It is a separate corporation. Shocking. And the third corporation is the Vatican City. In 1871, the United States became a sub-corporation of the United Kingdom and our president is the CEO of this corporation. All you got to do is read the District of Columbia Organic Act of 1871, passed by Congress. And when this act was passed, the Constitution changed names. It changed from the Constitution for the United States of America, notice the, type, the, the lowercase letters here, and it was changed to the Constitution of the United States of America. That's when our country became a corporation, a subsidiary, a subsidiary of the United Kingdom. 
And why did they do that? Because in, 18, in the 1800s, the United States was running short of money, and they needed money to be lent to them, and the, they got the money from the Bank of England, and England was going to control, saw their opportunity to control this corporation, this country. And they said, we'll lend you money if you do this. And they did. All you got to do is read the, there's a lot of references online for this. Now, when you look up the Federal Reserve in the government, the government website, it starts off by saying this, the Federal, the federal Reserve System is owned by no one. You see how the language is very important? They don't tell you the Federal Reserve Bank is owned by no one. They tell you the Federal Reserve System is owned by no one. Because it's a system. It's not owned by anyone. But the Federal Reserve Bank is owned by many private banks. We're going we're to get into that in a minute. So after this corporation, this act, the District of Columbia Organic Act was passed, 60 years later, the Federal Reserve Act was passed. Who's heard of the Federal Reserve Act? You guys have heard of that? It was passed in 1913 by Congress during a recess, during a Christmas recess. They underhanded, very underhanded. And then a few days later, they passed the Income Tax Act. And the Federal Reserve Act was created in London by Baron Alfred Rothschild, completing the enslavement of America to the international bankers. Now, I'll give you a list of all the banks that own the Federal Reserve. You can go look it up. It's a privately owned bank. Now, you see the $2 bills I have here in your handout? The first dollar bill was created after the Federal Reserve Act. What do you see on top of the dollar bill? Federal Reserve No. And what do you see on the do bottom dollar bill? And this is the dollar bill before the Federal Reserve Act. United States No. United States No. You see the change? As soon as the, in 1871, after, sorry, in 1913, when the, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed, the currency of the United States changed. The currency before that was backed by gold. So if you had a dollar before the Federal Reserve Act, your dollar was worth a dollar's worth of gold. But after that, all you got is a promissory note, and basically it's an IOU. And I give you references there, you can look that up at your leisure. Now we're going to get a little bit more deeper, so hang on to your, hang on to your hats. Uh, the Fed's founder, Nathan Rothschild, once boasted, Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. Our government had no debt until the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913. How much debt do we have now? Why do you think we have such a huge debt? Because the Federal Reserve makes money from the interest that we pay on this debt. It is to their best interest for us to be indebted so they can make money on the interest. They create the money out of thin air. They print the money. Because they have been given the authority by the United States government to print the money. And then they take the money and they lend it to the United States government. And because they lend it, they can charge interest on it. But according to the United States Constitution, our country has the right to print its own money interest-free. But they can no longer do that because they tied themselves to the Federal Reserve Bank. And what does this have to do with the Roman Catholic Church? Well, hang on. Remember we mentioned the United States became a sub-corporation of the United Kingdom in 1871? Well, the Federal Reserve Bank answers to who? The Bank of England. You've got to do a lot of digging to find this stuff out. The Bank of England opened in 1694, and it was the world's first central bank. Now, it went, or almost went into bankruptcy, and who do you think bailed out the Bank of England? You got one name, one family. The Rothschilds. They bailed them out when they almost went bankrupt, because they had the money to do it. And the Bank of England now answers to the Swiss Bank of International Settlements. This is the bank for the central banks. This thing is like a spider's web, interconnected, interweaved. And the Swiss Bank of International Settlements, or BIS, is said to have been created by the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, SMOM for short. And this order has headquarters in Switzerland, London, New York, and Dubai. 
And who do you think created the Swiss Bank of International Settlements? Okay. The Jesuits. They created this central. They created the bank for the central banks. All banks lead to Rome. In order for the Jesuits to create the New World Order, and trust me, they will create this New World Order. They must control the money supply of every country. You heard about the war on terror? Mm -hmm. Who, which countries did we attack? No. Two countries we attacked Iraq. predominantly. Who knows? Afghanistan, Afghanistan Iraq. and Iraq. Did you know that those countries had no central bank before the so-called war on terror? And guess what they have now? They have a central bank. And if you remember the terrorists, now I'm not going to get too deep into this, but if you remember the terrorists, where did they come from? 18 out of 19 terrorists. Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So why did we attack Afghanistan? I'm not going to get too deep into this. But the reason why, because they wanted to put a central bank in Afghanistan and Iraq. And right now, which two countries don't have a central bank? North Korea and Sorry, Iran. 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 Those are the two countries left without a central bank. And something's going to happen soon. Is they going to like get a bunch of countries? I don't know. They're, they're negotiating with North Korea right now. And they're going to put central bank in these countries because why? It's going to be a global system. They need to have every single country with a central bank so they can control the money supply. This Luigi Descantis wrote this. He was uh, an Italian priest and an official of the Inquisition. He later converted to Christianity. He re received Christ as a savior and became a pastor. He said this, In a country where there are Jesuits, they must either rule or the country must go to ruin. It is they who rule the world. And he was a Catholic priest, very prominent Catholic priest. But through the Inquisition, he got saved because he saw the suffering of the people that were dying and he couldn't believe why they were suffering and they were still were not renouncing Christ, the peace that they had over them. This other guy wrote a great book, Eric Phelps. He says, the Great Depression put all the smaller banks out of business and made the Federal Reserve Bank Lord of all. Now I'm going to read you an excerpt from the book Vatican Billions. The Vatican has large investments with the Rothschilds of Britain, France and America, the Ambrose Bank with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich in the United States is its large investments with the Morgan Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the First National Bank of New York, the Bankers Trust Company and others. The Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful international corporations such as Gulf Oil, Shell, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric International Business Machines, TWA, etc., etc., etc. And, and you can research this out, but you spend a lot of hours on it. The other thing you need to consider is not only do they have investments in many corporations, but look at the work of art that they own. The sheer volume of all the artifacts all across the world, the Catholic churches. How do you estimate the value of such, of such, such of these works of art? Someone said, take for example the Sistine Chapel. They say its real estate value is anywhere from 400 billion to $2 trillion. And if you look at some of these uh, cathedrals, they're beautiful. They're decked out with gold and silver. Where'd they get all the money for that? There's poverty in the world. And yet you have a church that's worth billions and trillions of dollars? How do you justify that? The true global wealth of the Roman Catholic Church is well hidden behind trusts, companies, cross ownerships, secretive laws. Uh, and you can't really come up with a, an exact value of the worth. Where I come in Canada, they own lots of land. The Catholic Church owns lots of land. And they even have their own real estate company. Where, I from, where I'm from, in the city I'm from, the Catholic Church has its own real estate company. The old, Mon the old Montreal Forum was owned, the land that it was on was owned by the Catholic Church. And when uh, Billy Graham wanted a crusade in the Montreal Forum, he couldn't make it, so he asked his brother-in-law, Leighton Ford, to lead the crusade. The only way they were allowing him to have a crusade, they would allow him to have a crusade, was if he had a Catholic priest open up the crusade in prayer. I saw it with my own eyes. And I was in shock. Here's a Christian crusade, and here comes this priest, and he goes to the podium, and he opens up the crusade in prayer. I was in shock. 
This is supposed to be a Christian crusade. Time will not permit us to go any deeper. I just scratched the surface. There's so much information on this, you can you can spend days and hours getting lost into it. Yes, the thing. How much would you estimate the Catholic Church is lost? Oh, I don't have no idea. I don't know. I'm not even going to bother. I, where do I start? <laughs> What's the next number higher, higher than Trinity? Revelation chapter 18, let's continue. Now, hopefully you will understand why God says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 3, the kings of the earth, that's the ruling families, have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth, the elite families, are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, the central banking system manipulated by the Jesuits. I know this is shocking. I don't know how many of you guys have heard this before, but... Sometimes every every few months I'll get on this rabbit trail and I'll start reading and reading and reading and I gotta stop because there's so much information out there. It's like a it's like a spider's web. All the connections around the world. Think about this. Which religion has its own country? Catholicism. Catholicism. What is the country called? Vatican City. Vatican City. They have their own Vatican Bank. And how do they get favors by the politicians in Italy? They allow them, anyone who has an account in the Vatican Bank pays no taxes. So, to get favors from the politicians in Italy, they allow them to open accounts in the Vatican Bank. And when they do so, all their money is completely tax-free. What a Ponzi scheme. You try to do that. But God is pleading with the people in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and be ye not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. My people is a reference to the Jews during the tribulation who will be made who have made a pact with the mother of harlots. But spiritually it can be applied to Christians. And I believe you can tell a Catholic, point him to his verse, and says, Look, God tells you to get out of the system. And I don't understand how some Catholics who claim to be saved can still be partakers of this religious system that is damning so many people to hell through their false gospel. And Jeremiah prophesied of this event in chapter 51, verse 1 and 7. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up against Babylon, and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. And I will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her, and shall empty her land, for in the day of trouble, now we said, what does a day of trouble refer to in the Bible? It's Jacob's trouble. It's Jacob's uh, trouble. It's a tribulation. tribulation yeah. They shall be against her round about. Against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow. And against him that lifteth himself up <coughs> in his brigandine. And spare ye not her young men. Destroy ye utterly all her host. Host is another word in the Bible for army. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. Now this is a double prophecy, talking about the destruction of Babylon, the empire of Babylon, and the future mystery Babylon. Look at verse 5. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord, Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense that is a reward. We said, what is the Lord's, Lord's vengeance? In the book of Isaiah, we talked about it. The Lord's vengeance, the Lord's vengeance is the second coming of Christ when he comes back and he pours his wrath upon the earth. And again, you see this plea again in verse 45 of Jeremiah 51. My people... Go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. I'm going to read this verse slowly. Go out of the midst of her. God is pleading with his people. And deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. That's the second coming of Christ. When God, in his anger, comes back to destroy those who have gone against him and his nation of Israel. God is saying, get out because I will soon punish her for her iniquities. When God is telling his people to get out because I will soon punish her for her iniquities, 
Does that sound like a rapture to you? You know, those who believe in the pre-wrath rapture? This, to me, does not sound like a rapture. God is there getting to destroy Mystery Babylon. He's getting to destroy the nations that have come up against Jerusalem. And he's saying, get out so that you be not be, so that you be not a partaker of the judgment that I will pour upon, I will pour upon her for her sins. Verse 6 of Revelation chapter 18. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. God saying, I will punish her double for what she did to you. Every single Christian that has been martyred, every single Christian that has died, every single person of God, we can say, that has been killed, God, it will come into God's remembrance that day. And God says, I will punish Mystery Babylon double. Verse 7. How much she had glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. And what is this day? It's one day. Can anyone tell me what this one day is? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. During the second coming of Christ, God has reached his limit. He will tolerate no more disobedience. He will tolerate no more sin. He will tolerate no more rebellion. Verse 9. And hopefully now you'll understand this statement. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of a burning. The kings of the earth. Standing afar off, the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. In one hour, God's going to destroy this mystery Babylon. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth the merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver. Now, these two verses, pay attention how they end up. Verse 12 and 13. I want you to pay attention how God ends, ends, ends these two verses. And this is what they trafficked in. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner of, and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves, and souls of men. So God is telling you this system, Mystery Babylon, is not only trafficking in material goods, but it's also trafficking in the souls of men. It's almost like they've equated the souls of men just as material goods. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more. The fruits Rome lusted after began with gold and ended with the souls of men. She trafficked in the souls of men. The Western world under the direct influence of Catholicism has one objective. Acquire more gold, acquire more gold. Christmas. What's the danger of Christmas? It's been commercialized. They've taken Christ completely out. In fact, one of our previous presidents never said Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Mm -hmm. They've taken our holiday where we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you're telling me not to say Merry Christmas? Yet you're taking time off. You're buying gifts for your family and your, and your friends. But you're not going to allow me to say Merry Christmas on this holiday that you're celebrating? Does that make any sense? Easter has been commercialized. And this is the sad reality here. How many Catholics end up in hell because of their allegiance to this false religious system. Look at all the things that the Catholic Church does. Indulgences. Who knows what that is? Paying for Paying? less time in purgatory. Yeah. Confession. Extreme unction. Prayers for the dead. Absolution. You can actually, there was a point in the history of the Catholic Church where they said, for this year, for one time only, fire sale. 
you pay this amount of money and your sin, all of your sins will be forgiven you and you won't have to pay us another dime again. It happened in the history of the Catholic Church. And a lot of people did that. They said, oh great, I'm going to give the church X amount of dollars and I will be forgiven of all my sins that I will commit from here on. That's a great deal. Bargain. Uh, crusaders. I don't know. I don't know the amount. Do you know when that happened? Yes, a few hundred years ago. Oh. There was a fire crusaders, sale. Yeah. Crusaders were absolved of their sons. Yeah, if you signed up, yeah, if you signed up for the Crusades okay. to go fight the uh, Islamic horde, then you were for, you were say you were forgiven of all your sins. You'd go straight to heaven if you died in the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Why well, can you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and not pay a dime? Or you can accept Christ as your Savior, someone said, and not pay a dime. See, I, I like that. They never told you that. No, no. Let, let's continue on. We're almost done over here. The lament of Rome's allies. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her. Now, once the reason why I went through the central banking system and the Federal Reserve System and the, all these financial systems, because a lot of people have been made wealthy through these systems. Now, the people that own these banks that own the Federal Reserve, you can't buy shares in these banks. They are inherited. Whoever owns the bank bequeaths them to their children. You can't get in on the scheme. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off of the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple, here's the purple and scarlet again, Remember we meant, we showed you how this church is clothed in purple and scarlet and decked with golds and precious stones and pearls for in one hour so great riches. Now if you somebody asked how, what's the wealth of the Catholic Church? So great riches. I'm going to guess it's, it's probably, come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. I can't get into this verse because there's actually a a maritime law that the Catholics uh, helped put in place that dictates all financial contracts. I don't have time to get into this, but look into that. Next week. Uh, it's interesting that they mentioned all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of a burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust upon their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. In one hour, the global financial system created by the Antichrist and this mystery Babylon religion, the horror of Revelation, will come to naught. It will be destroyed. It will collapse. Collapse. Global financial collapse during the tribulation in one hour. Through God's judgment, the Bible says, nothing will be left. Nothing. And God will destroy the system in one hour. And guess who will be happy? God's people will be happy. In, Re in verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. For God hath avenged you <coughs> on her. Now, notice the, the, the words here. We're going to be in heaven. And once we hear, I don't know if we're going to see, but there's going to be a big hole. We talked about it. When Christ comes back during the second coming, there's going to be a big hole and people on earth will see the Lord coming down on earth. The Bible says once we see the destruction of this system, of this religious, political, economic system, we will, be re we will rejoice. And look at the last few words of verse 20. For God hath avenged you on her. Remember the tribulation saints? What was one of the things they prayed for when they went to heaven? How long, to, how long will you avenge our blood? Because what, what will happen to the tribulation saints? How will they go to heaven? They will be beheaded. They will be beheaded. And when they get to heaven, they will ask God to avenge their blood. In verse 21, And a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers, and musicians, and of pipers, pipers are like flute players, and trumpeters, shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. 
the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride. No more wedding. See that? That's a church setting right there. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more in all, at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. You see that statement there? The great men of the earth? Who are these great men of the earth? These are the men, the elites, that we call the elites, the ones that actually run the world's economic system. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her... So now here's the, the connection. Now you may read all this and you may say, I, I, I have a hard time believing that this is the Roman Catholic Church. Look at verse 24. And in her was found what? The blood of the prophets, yes, and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now I don't have time to get into how the world wars and the civil wars were started by a certain group. Interesting. Do some reading on that. We note that a stone will be cast upon the great city, the Vatican City, and it shall be no more. It reminds me of the stone in Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. When Christ comes back, the Bible says he will take a big stone and he will destroy all the kingdoms of the earth. And I gave you the, uh, the references here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 43 through 45. And according to Revelation chapter 17, verse 16, before this thing happens, all nations will have gathered against the Antichrist. Why? Because they will realize at some point that the system that he created was the reason why they're suffering all these great plagues and, 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 uh, and the things that God will pour upon the earth. To me, the clincher, not the only clincher, but verse 24 is very telling. Because this verse tells us, in her was found the blood of the prophets. Do you know how many, if you were here during Wednesday nights and we went through Baptist history and distinctives, we went through all the persecution that Christians endured from the time of the Roman Empire to the present time. How many millions and millions of Christians were put to death? Why? Because they didn't believe, like the Catholic Church. Back in the Dark Ages, now they've rewritten history books, and the Dark Ages is no longer called the Dark Ages, it's called, who can tell me what it's called? The Middle Ages. The Middle Ages. How convenient. It was called Dark Ages by historians, but they changed it now to Middle Ages. What happened during that time period? Anyone who didn't believe like the Catholics did, they were killed. They were burned at the stake. The, the property was confiscated. They were tortured. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I'm telling you, if you read some of these books, you will actually come to tears. How your spiritual ancestors, what they suffered under this institution. Remember when we said during the tribulation those who will be beheaded will go to heaven and this is their prayer. Revelation chapter 6 verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying How long O Lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And that prayer will be answered in Revelation chapter 18 verse 20. They prayed and they asked God to avenge them of their death. And in verse 20 of chapter 18, the Bible says, God hath avenged you on her. In Psalms 116, verse 15, the Bible says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. And next week, we're going to look at the second coming of Christ in, again in chapter 19. So, I know this was a lot of information I threw at you, but hopefully it'll, it'll get you thinking. And again, if you have any questions now or comments, uh, feel free to ask them. And we will try to answer your questions. If not, we'll get back to you on a future lesson. Any questions or comments? Uh, Go ahead, uh, sir. You, you said up back on page four that Sweden is going to go to all the, the chips and their cashless. They're going, yeah, by 2023, they're going to be, I believe that's the year, they're going to be completely cashless. Yeah, they're, they're pretty much cashless now. Yeah, but they're going to be officially completely. They will not accept any currency of any kind. I just had dinner with a couple who uh, just came back from Sweden. Really? And, um, and what was unique about this is that she she knows her from her previous job. And she said she just got back from Sweden. They tried to buy something, not allowed to even use cash. And she thought it was the coolest thing. Really? 
had no idea. Coolest thing that she couldn't buy anything with cash. Yeah, she went here to buy a car, as a matter of fact, the ball oh, line. A car. Yeah. Oh, were these people from Sweden? No. No, she okay. went over there, picked out the car she wanted. Okay, so she went to Sweden, tried to buy a car, and they said, we don't accept cash. Yeah, what they shipped it over here for. Right. But, I mean, to go out to dinner, to buy a pack of gum, yeah. to well, go have a right. cup of coffee, no cash. We couldn't even accept it. That's what's, hot. That's what's coming our way. It's already there. I mean, yeah. It's already there. I know they want to do it by 2022, whatever. Yeah. That's probably for little mom and pop's pizza restaurants yeah. because it's already there. I, I think what's happening is as we're getting closer, things are going to accelerate very rapidly. With technology, sure, easy. It's too you easy. know, it's like we're coming to the end, right? And we're gonna, things are accelerating the next few years. Any other questions or comments? Okay, that's that's good. No questions. Doesn't the um, go ahead. On page ten, I wrote another note. Yeah. Talking about the Catholic Church, and you had made mention during your lesson that how could all these people uh, not know or not turn their back and, and, and seek truth? Doesn't it say that they're going to, in the end, end times they're going to be willfully ignorant? Yeah. Then and and the thing is, the, the the question was. Sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend or grasp the fact that people can be so blind. It's very hard. And then the question is, doesn't the Bible say that they will be willfully ignorant? The Bible mentions a couple of things that are, that's going to happen in the end times. They're going to be taken captive by the devil at his will. And the other danger is that there's going to be apostasy among Christians. It doesn't mean they're going to lose their salvation. It means that during the end times, Christians themselves will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's why you have so many, someone called it the isms and schisms of Christianity. How can all these Christians have all these point of view, different point of views? Because the devil is active. And remember what we said during the message on this past Sunday. The devil has two plans. Plan A and plan B. Who can know who plan A is? He, his plan A is to keep people from getting saved. And plan B... That's to keep Christians from maturing. If he can keep you as an infant, as a Christian, as a carnal Christian, as a Christian who's still just saved, hasn't grown, because he doesn't want you to grow and mature, because once you grow and mature, you become a threat. Why do you become a threat? Because you realize the power that you have living inside you. And what is that power? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is? Jesus Christ. And God. God lives inside you. And that's a lot of power inside you. And once you understand the power that you have, and you, through the Holy Spirit, learn how to make your, how to avail yourself of this power, you become a threat to the devil. And he doesn't want you to wake up to this power that you have. And that's why I believe a lot of Christians struggle. And that's why I believe a lot of Christians have a hard time with things. Because they haven't realized who is living inside them. That's an amazing truth, an amazing truth. You know how you said, uh, like, the Catholics were, I mean, yeah, did you say, like, our ancestors in the past... Spiritual ancestors. ...were killed. Killed, yes. But, like, we research, like, I was Catholic, and I know that it goes back in my family far. And you said, I thought you said that. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. About being in those, if we research, we might be able to see that. But wouldn't like the generations know that bad stuff happened to their ancestors? They don't read. They don't research. Yeah. They don't read. They don't and know. No one would just pass it on to their like. My grandmother would not tell her. If you remain, if I mean, I'm not saying you're making a general statement here. If you come from a line of Catholics, yes. they were never killed because they remain. They stay true to the Catholic Church. So they were never persecuted, they never chased. So you are, myself too, from Greek Orthodox in Greece, you are descendants of the people that killed the Christians, our spiritual ancestors. I'm not saying you killed them, I'm yeah, saying we're the descendants of those who escaped. And a, a lot of priests, during the Reformation, a lot of priests came out of the Catholic Church. They tried to reform the Catholic Church from within, but they all realized that they couldn't do it. So they left the Catholic Church. And once they did that, they were persecuted, they were chased down, they were hunted down, they were killed. 
it, it's sad. History is... What they say what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Mm -hmm. And the same, look what's happening around us today. In the Western, we, we're so comfortable here. We're so comfortable. It, back several hundred years ago, our spiritual ancestors would have to run for their lives. In, in fact, in Rome, they lived in the catacombs, underground cities they had. They were digging tunnels. They were hiding in tunnels under the city to escape the Roman government. From being killed. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful that I'm living in this day and age. And, and, and I had this thought this morning. I said to myself, if those people were so devoted to God, they, they, they didn't have anything that we have today. And they had to run for their lives. They didn't know when the next meal was going to come from. And they were that much devoted to God. How much more should I be devoted to God? That I don't have to run for my life. I don't have to fear for my life. I have a roof over my head. My pantry is full, my fridge is full. You know, you don't have to worry about anything. But again, that becomes a danger where you can fall asleep and say, I'm comfortable. I don't really need God. Like uh, me and Mike would talk about it. It's not a matter of what we're going to eat. It's a matter of how much we're going to eat. Any other questions or comments? Well, next week we're going to look at the second coming of Christ. And how he's going to come back in vengeance and he's going to destroy everything in his sight, pretty much. And we're going to come back with him, riding on white horses. Don't miss it next week, Revelation chapter 19.